So today we're going to look at the NIV Study Bible. This is one of the best-selling study Bibles of all time. It's been around since the mid-80s and a new edition has just been released in 2020. So if you go into a store today, you won't find one that looks like this. It will look like this. The 2020 fully revised edition has been upgraded completely. So it's full color now, whereas earlier editions were black and white. New essays have been added throughout the text. Notes that were previously in this edition have been expanded and given their own page in some instances. But the material is overall very similar between the two. So this review is going to focus on earlier editions because this is the one I have. If you're thinking about getting a 2020 edition, it will be similar to what we're going to look at just in color, a little nicer, a little more updated. And there are a couple of changes, one of which we'll note later in this review, that do make a difference. The NIV Study Bible, at least this compact edition, is 2,198 pages. There are 15 pages in the back that are blank for notes, as well as 16 pages of full color maps. It's available in paperback, hardback, leather, uh, fake leather, duotone, personal size, large print, Kindle. It's pretty much available across the board. It is double column with cross references in the center column, and there are over 100,000 cross references throughout. Notable contributors to the NIV Study Bible. Many of the familiar names that you've heard in other Bible reviews that we've done here on Disciple Dojo, Kenneth Barker, Craig Blomberg, Mark Strauss, Ronald Youngblood, Walter Kaiser, Ronald Allen, Edwin Yamauchi, Derek Kidner, Gleason Archer, John Steck, Leon Morris, Gerald Hawthorne, and Robert Mounts. Broadly evangelical scholars from a number of traditions all within the overall umbrella of evangelicalism. Like most Zondervan study Bibles at the beginning, there's a full color timeline that walks you through biblical history. And there are around 20,000 study notes in the text. So all of the, these columns here at the bottom of the page. And the study notes, some of them are actually categorized in terms of what type of notes they are. Notes that have a little sapling, a little picture of a leaf sapling. Those are notes that are application notes. Those are notes intended to tell you how to apply passages to your life. Notes that have archaeological spade symbol. Those are notes that are archaeological or historical. And then lastly, there are these little notes that are of a little face, little person. And those are notes that tell you about specific characters or personalities in the text. Then the rest of the notes are, are general study notes to just help you understand what's on the page what the text is actually saying. Each book has an introduction and an overall outline, some longer than others, depending on the overall length or content of the book in question. The book introductions aren't quite commentary level. They aren't as robust as some of the other study Bibles, but they're not paltry by any means. They're good book introductions overall. They're going to tell you what to expect when you read that book. In the back, it contains not an exhaustive concordance, but probably one of the most significant concordances that you'll find in a study Bible, the one put together by Kohlenberger and Goodrich. It's not exhaustive, but it does contain more than a lot of other study Bibles concordances that you'll come across. In addition to the color maps at the back of the NIV study Bible, there are also black and white maps sprinkled throughout, about 50 of them throughout the text, as well as illustrations of things like the temple, tabernacle, priestly implements, etc. And there are about 40 charts that you'll find throughout the pages of all kinds of subject matter, anything that can be presented graphically. Now in the updated, the 2020 version, all of this is in color. The layout has been ramped up some. Some things that were just small in the earlier editions are now kind of blown up to a full page presentation. Similar to what we saw when we looked at the NLT Study Bible and the NLT Illustrated Study Bible. There are also seven introductory essays on things like wisdom literature, the minor prophets, the synoptic gospels, the pastoral epistles, the general epistles, ancient warfare, and the intertestamental period. And at the beginning, there are a couple of pages of ancient Near Eastern texts that are important 
in understanding and interpreting the Old Testament. At the back, there's a subject index. So if you want to look up themes or ideas or subjects that are covered in the notes, you can look there. It's not like a concordance where you're looking up words that are actually in the text of Scripture. Rather, these are things that are found in the notes that accompany the text. You can find this pretty easily. The New Testament also contains a harmony of the Gospels. So the events of Jesus's life are kind of put in a hypothetical chronological order. And this is a red letter edition. So the supposed words of Jesus are printed in red letters. In terms of Genesis, you're going to find the focus in this study Bible is on putting the text in its Mesopotamian or ancient Near East context. And there's going to be less on how we bridge that with a modern scientific understanding of the world. So you're not going to get a lot of young earth creationism or old earth creationism or how exactly the mechanics of creation or the flood or any of these prehistory events really relate to our modern views of the world. You're going to get notes that focus on what would the text have meant to the readers at the time. The notes on creation, for example, take for granted the framework concept, and that's primarily what they're working from, where each of the first three days of creation correspond to the second three days of creation. So you have the realms being created in the first three days and the rulers of those realms being installed in the next three days. That's what you're going to note in the study notes, and it's an important literary feature of the text for sure. If you want more on this, like a lot more, we have an entire course available for free here at Disciple Dojo called The Bible and Science, Friends or Foes. You can click on this link if you'd like access to that course. It's entirely free, including a downloadable PDF workbook. And we do a deep dive on Genesis 1, questions of science, interpretation, ancient Near East setting, all of that stuff, hours of it for free. So go ahead and click that link if you haven't taken that course yet. There's a good overview in Genesis about the different covenants and what type of covenants there existed in the ancient world. Hugely important for reading not just Genesis but also the rest of the Torah because the entire Torah and particularly Deuteronomy is patterned around a covenant treaty outline. And so knowing that really helps us in our understanding and our interpretation of why the Torah and, and Deuteronomy in particular are structured the way they're structured by the author. In terms of the Genesis flood Again, this is a broadly evangelical study Bible meant to be used by people in a wide variety of traditions. So they tell you why some Christians hold to the view of a truly global worldwide flood and why other Christians hold to an interpretation where the flood was universal from the perspective of the author, but not necessarily literally a global flood. You're going to get both of those views presented and they're going to be pretty noncommittal in terms of which side they lean to. When we get to Exodus, and this is something you see with a number of Zondervan study Bibles, with the exception of the archaeological study Bible or the cultural background study Bible, the discussion of the events and the historicity surrounding the Exodus don't really give a lot of attention to anything other than the traditional view or the southern route of the Exodus. They acknowledge that there are other alternate proposed Mount Sinai's or proposed routes of the Exodus, but they don't really present them. The updated 2020 edition gives a little more discussion, but not very much, and it pretty quickly dismisses any of the other suggested sites or locations for the Exodus. You can see they put the crossing of the Red Sea as somewhere up in one of these lakes. I mean, up like in the Goshen area, whereas other study Bibles that we've looked at put it either down here at the Suez Canal or over at the Gulf of Aqaba. And even in the updated edition, they don't really go into any of that. As an Exodus teacher, again, that's I take these passages that, that are significant to me and I look at how different study Bibles handle them. And so it's not an overall knock against a study Bible's reliability by any means. It's just kind of disappointing. They do contain a layout of the Hebrew calendar in black and white, very plain in the older editions, the 2020 edition, it's much sleeker, much sexier. I don't know if sexy is the right word to describe calendar, but it's laid out more graphically appealing. There are also a few illustrations of the implements involving the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, things like that. Not very many in this edition, more in the 2020 edition. Now, the 2002 edition and earlier 
is based on the text of the NIV, the original NIV 1984 translation. So the notes, the study notes, reflect that. In the 2020 edition, it's based on the text of the NIV 2011. And there are some fairly significant changes. And you see this when we come to Romans in particular. So for instance, the original NIV, the earlier versions of the NIV, translate Romans 7 verse 5 as, For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. And it goes on. That phrase, controlled by the sinful nature. In the 2020, the new study Bible, they're using the NIV 2011 translation, and it reads, when we were in the realm of the flesh. And so the study note talks about what in the realm of the flesh means. So the study notes have to be changed in certain instances because the translation that they're talking about has changed between the different editions. In terms of whether Paul is talking about himself and his ongoing struggle with sin or the other view of him speaking prior to his conversion or speaking as if he were still in Adam, the earlier edition takes the view that Paul is talking in some way about his past in Romans chapter 7. And in the 2020 updated revised edition, they even add, or he could be talking about Adam and Eve or someone who is in Adam. So the updated 2020 version, the notes do a better job of presenting more of what could be happening than even the notes in the earlier edition. So you do get both views that are acknowledged, but the notes are going to lean to, Paul is talking about his past life in Romans chapter 7, which is one of the possibilities. And in the revised, the updated 2020 edition, the note on chapter 7 verse 9 specifically adds in the concept of him speaking as if he were Adam, which I think is fairly undeniable in terms of the imagery that Paul was using in chapter 7, describing sin's effect on this I character, whoever the I of Romans 7 is, and that will depend on which view you take. When we get to Romans chapter 9, similar to other study Bibles by Zondervan that we've looked at, the note on chapter 9, verse 13, about Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, just asserts that it's talking about individual election rather than corporate election, which is interesting because I'll, I'll read you the note. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. In verse 6 through 13, Paul is clearly dealing with personal and not national election. He is not portraying the nation Israel, Jacob, over the nation Edom, Esau. Though Malachi 1 verse 2 and 3, which he's quoting, does speak of the nations. Paul's intention is evident in light of the problem he is addressing. How can God's promise stand when so many who comprise Israel, in the Old Testament collective sense, are unbelieving and therefore cut off? They just assert, whoever did this study note, and, and this, is, this note has appeared in other Zondervan study Bibles when we come to Romans 9, that's a really bad note. You, Zondervan, come on. You, need to, you can't just assert something when there's clear differences between Christians on how they interpret that. You got to do a little better, but at least they do note, yes, Malachi, who Paul is quoting, was talking about nations. He was speaking corporately. It's disappointing that they just completely dismiss the corporate interpretation of Romans chapter 9. I don't know why they did it. Maybe they'll see this and fix it. When we come to chapter 11 and the all Israel will be saved, the notes in both editions do discuss the different views on who this all Israel is and what all Israel being saved will look like. And it gives, I believe, three different views. In the updated 2020 version, it's actually kind of like a full page or maybe a half page article on it instead of just in this version, a note down at the bottom of that section. When we come to Revelation, the introduction is good at giving the different ways Revelation has been read, the different schools of interpretation. The background notes to the seven churches that John is writing to are very good, and they get Laodicea right. We always look at Revelation chapter 3 and whether a study Bible will give you that needed background for Jesus' words about being hot or being cold or being lukewarm. The study notes in here, they nail it especially in the updated 2020 edition. They really do a good job of showing that to the Laodiceans, Jesus was invoking a specific image about their city's water supply, which is incredibly helpful in understanding that passage. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, 
click this video. We go into it there. Similarly, when we come to Revelation 20 and the understanding of the millennium, the study notes give you the different views and they don't take a committed stand on which view the reader should hold. I mentioned that there's a difference in the study notes to earlier editions that use the old NIV text and the new edition, which uses the NIV 2011 text. And I want to show you an example of what exactly I'm talking about so you can see a little bit of what's going on here. In 1 Corinthians 14, the NIV used to translate verse 33 one way, and the 2011 edition of the NIV changed it and translates that verse in a very different way. Now, we go into this more in our Bible for the Rest of Us course. So if you want to know about this translation and what's going on there in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, and 34, go ahead and click on this video after you watch this review, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm also going to show you here in, in this review so you can get a little glimpse of it. So consider this an excursus to our typical study Bible reviews here at Disciple Dojo. And bear with me for a few minutes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, let me show you this on camera. The NIV translation originally broke the paragraph in the middle of verse 33. They started a new paragraph. So it reads... In the NIV, the old NIV reads, The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Period. New paragraph. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law, capital L, says. And then the study note following that says, as the law says, see Genesis 3.16 and 1 Peter 3.6 and the note. So this would say, so this is talking about Genesis 3.16, which is when God told Eve, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Which, okay, that's the only thing they can find. Now in the early 2000s, the TNIV was released. The TNIV, today's New International Version, was a short-lived translation that sought to update some things in the NIV without upsetting the NIV readers. So they wanted to offer kind of, it was almost like trying to appeal to two different audiences with two similar but slightly different names translations. And so the TNIV translated 1 Corinthians 14, this section, this way. Listen to the difference. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the congregation of the Lord's people, period. New paragraph, new, new page in this edition. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law, lowercase l, says. Now, in the TNIV study Bible, which is basically the same, these are basically the same study notes, but these are key to the TNIV translation. And look at this. As the law says, they left law capitalized in the study notes. So the study notes don't reflect the translation of the TNIV. So why does that matter? Well, the updated 2020 edition of the NIV Study Bible is based on the NIV 2011 translation. And the NIV 2011 translation reads as the TNIV translated it. So the notes to the 2020 edition of the NIV Study Bible now say, and I'll put an image of it on the screen here so you can see it, as the law says, lowercase l. And then the note has added, this is a puzzling statement since the OT law nowhere says this. Some interpreters have pointed to Genesis 3.16 or 1 Peter 3.6. Yes, yeah, some interpreters, meaning the interpreters who did the earlier edition of the NIV Study Bible. And they've even added a full-page discussion of this verse entitled, Women Remaining Silent. So that's a significant difference between all the earlier editions of the NIV Study Bible and the revised 2020 edition of the NIV Study Bible. It's interesting to see how the study notes caught up with the NIV translation as it went from NIV 1984, TNIV, NIV 2011.
And that's also one of the reasons why a lot of evangelical complementarian Christians no longer use or recommend the NIV. Or they say, if you're going to use the NIV, use the 1984, use the earlier NIV, because they think the NIV 2011, which is what, if you go on a Bible app, it's going to be the NIV 2011. And so it's going to translate passages like 1 Corinthians 14 in a way that more complementarian leaning Christians aren't happy with. Super Bible nerdy stuff here. Most readers won't even notice it. But if you're watching a review on study Bibles, you're probably the type of person who would notice that, or at least who would care when it's pointed out. That's why this is on the Bible Nerds playlist. So the old NIV study Bible, pretty even keel, may lean a little or allow a little more of a complementarian reading. The updated 2020 version leans a little more to the egalitarian or non-complementarian interpretation. So would I recommend the NIV study Bible? It's a very vanilla study Bible, honestly. If you're an NIV person, I would probably recommend some of the other study Bibles that are out there in the NIV, Archaeological Study Bible, Cultural Background Study Bible, for general readers, the Life Application Study Bible. That's always my number one recommendation for your average reader. This is kind of in between the Life Application Study Bible and something like the Archaeological or the Cultural Background Study Bible. So like on this side, you'd have Life Application, and on this side, you'd have more academic this is kind of right in the middle of those. It's a good study Bible. It is a good study Bible. Do I recommend it? Yeah, I do. You know, I'd, I'd give it a A, A minus maybe. They need to fix a couple of things in Romans, do better on Exodus. But overall, yeah, high B, B plus, A minus, somewhere in there. Would it make a good primary study Bible? Sure. Yeah, if you really like the NIV uh, and you're broadly evangelical, then I could see this as a primary study Bible. It, it's comparable to others that are out there. Those are my thoughts. As always, these reviews are entirely subjective. There are tons of passages, things that I didn't even get a chance to look at. What do you think? How many of you use this as your primary study Bible. This has been on the market for decades now, so there's a generation or two that have grown up with this as their study Bible of choice. Tell me what you think in the comments below. As always, if you appreciate these reviews, be sure to click like and subscribe. That's the key, guys. Subscribers are huge for any YouTube channel, and Disciple Dojo is no exception. If you have particular study Bibles you would like to see me review, drop it in the comments below. Let me know which one. I'm always on the lookout. I want these reviews to be helpful. I want people who are looking for study Bibles either to give to someone as a gift or to use in your own church ministry or even for your own personal study. I want these reviews to be helpful so you can evaluate because study Bibles aren't cheap. So we want to give you help here at Disciple Dojo, equip you to be able to know what you're looking for and what you're going to find out there on the study Bible market. Be sure to check out our reviews of other study Bibles and go ahead and subscribe so that you don't miss future ones. We're going to continue doing these reviews and build a catalog of nerdy study Bible reviews for whoever out there will find them helpful. That's it, folks. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.